Now at this time, I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker. He's a native Harlan Countyan, and I share that distinction with him. And he's now Kentucky's Commissioner of the Department for Public Health, Dr. Jeffrey D. Howard, Jr. Well, I only get called Jeffrey when I'm in trouble, uh, or, or, my, or my mama calls, so. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here with you guys today, and you've heard so much about what's going on in our state and our country uh, on this issue. And I think what you should be reassured is that there is a lot going on and that you have people both in this state and in our federal delegation who are supporting you. Let me say, and I, say, I said this last time I spoke in Pikeville, but I, I really feel the need to say it again because it rings true every time. But it doesn't matter if I'm traveling I-75 South back home to Eastern Kentucky and Bell County and Harlan County, or if I'm coming the Mountain Parkway in this direction. As soon as those low rolling Appalachian Mountains begin to peek over the horizon, I just get the same feeling of awe every time. And then as we come in a little further and the mountains rise up around you, it's like driving into a, a warm embrace. And you know that you're home. And you know where you're, that you are where you belong. And last night we were out having dinner. It was was so nice and, and I think we had a good meal and, but a, as I was sitting there I was thinking to myself I, I just love being with folks from Eastern Kentucky everybody was so happy so congenial and it, I miss Eastern Kentucky so much and I can't I can't wait to return uh, as Tom said I grew up in Harlan County and that's the reason this issue is so important to me because I saw so many of my friends my family members affected by substance abuse disorder for those of you who know about me, you know that I grew up in a home with a mother and a stepfather who were addicted to drugs. It started out after a surgery. My mother had a, a routine operation, was a prescribed prescription uh, opioids to a level that she shouldn't have been. They were continued and continued. That prescription was renewed many times over when it shouldn't have been. And before long, she progressed. She progressed to the point that she was using Oxycontin, a drug that has become emphasis, infamous in Eastern Kentucky. And because of that, I've seen firsthand as a child and experienced the negative effects of substance abuse disorder. So that's the reason I'm so passionate about this issue. That's the reason I want to see us eradicate substance abuse disorder and its effects from our society, especially here in Eastern Kentucky. Before I move on, let me, I, I want to thank a few people that often uh, are at these events and, and they get acknowledged sometimes, but they really should be more. And one is, is Representative Hal Rogers. Representative Rogers has done so much for this region, but in creating SOAR and, and continuing to commit efforts and funding to SOAR, he's done a great deal in, in helping us combat substance abuse disorder. Next is Jared Arnett. Jared, you've done so much in propagating the message of SOAR, continuing to fund uh, uh, continuing to fight for funding for SOAR. But what I'm most impressed with, Jared, and, and, and following what you're doing with this is that you seem to really have understood the comprehensive nature that, um, uh, of efforts that are required to move a population forward. If you want a productive population, it doesn't matter if it's in Eastern Kentucky, it doesn't matter where it's at, you've got to have three things. You've got to have wealth, so you've got to have a good economy, you have to have productive jobs, you have to have health, because if you don't have a healthy population, you don't have anybody to work those jobs, and you have to have solid education. And if you don't have any of those, all of them will fall to the least. And Jared has really had a comprehensive vision for what that is. So folks, give Jared a big hand. <laughs> Sincerely, Jared, thank you for all you do. You know, another group that really needs to be uh, thanked here is Governor Bevin and our, and our legis uh, legislators who have committed funding for combating substance abuse to a level you've, you have never seen before. That's going to allow us to do things you haven't seen before. Um, treatment, prevention, recovery sports are going to be funded and available in a way they haven't been before, and we're tremendously grateful for that. You're going to hear more about that from some other people later. In the same vein, our federal delegation, and you're going to hear from Senator McConnell later, um, has continued to support us, has ensured that we have secured funding for this region many times over. Tom Vicini and Nancy Hale, the work you guys are doing in Unite, especially in the SOAR uh, counties, is just unbelievable. Thank you for all you continue to do there. And lastly, and I, I, I don't see Jenna, but Megan Williamson, Jenna Meyer, who are here in Eastern Kentucky, who have relocated our CDC appointees, they continue to work very, very hard for Eastern Kentucky. In my heart, at least, they are adopted Eastern Kentuckians, and we are so thankful for you and what you do here. If you guys don't mind, give Jenna and Megan a warm hand. <laughs> uh, 
And lastly, and, and most importantly, thank you. Thank you to each of you who showed up today, even the medical students who were apparently forced to come. We're, we're grateful for you, grateful for what you're doing, the fact that you're here, the fact that you're continuing to fight, that you're continuing to put your interest and efforts into this issue is tremendous. And that's why we will be successful in eradicating substance abuse and, and its negative effects from Eastern Kentucky. But let me let me set the stage for a little bit. I, I'm supposed to talk about the role of public health, and I'll get to that. I also have the unique challenge of finishing up in, in three minutes, which I don't think I'll do, uh, but I'll get close as I can. But the, the cost of substance abuse disorder is often quantified or qualified in terms of deaths. And we all know that one American dies every approximately 12 and a half minutes from a drug-related overdose. We had over 1,500 Kentuckians die last year from a substance-related overdose death. That's almost four every day. That's almost four of our friends, our family, our neighbors, our colleagues who have died. But the deaths underestimate the true effect of this disease. You see, substance abuse disorder has far-reaching effects into parts of our life uh, that go beyond just the number of people who have died. It affects our overall health outcomes. The number of uh, bacterial endocarditis requiring valvular, trans or valv valvular surgery is on the rise. It's almost astronomical. It's affecting our economy. Ha all of us know people in their 20s and 30s who otherwise would be healthy and in the workforce but are not uh, because they have substance abuse disorder. There's a few important public health issues that I want to uh, raise attention to. Neonatal abstinence syndrome. The number of children who are being born physiologically dependent on opioids is astronomical and rising and we have some of the highest rates in the nation here in eastern Kentucky and that is an absolute travesty and something we must address. Our, our prison and jail systems are absolutely bloated. At any given time we have, Van correct me if I'm wrong, almost what 44,000 people in our prison and jail system. That's astronomical folks. We have one of the highest rates of female incarceration in the country and you better believe that that is due to substance abuse disorder. And just imagine how many kids are growing up in homes without their parents or being raised by grandparents because of substance use disorder and incarceration associated with that. That number is tremendous and it's leading to a generational propagation of substance abuse disorder and we must address it. And that brings me to one of my absolute priorities which is adverse childhood events. I'm going on a tangent here about adverse childhood events a little bit, forgive me for it, but every time I have the opportunity to speak to a group like this, I think it is incumbent upon me to talk about adverse childhood events or ACEs. These are events that occur in a child's life that are linked to negative outcomes uh, in that child's future. Those include negative health outcomes, such as heart disease, stroke, diabetes, even living uh, less years. These events are things like abuse, neglect, but they also include having a parent that's incarcerated, having a parent who's addicted to substances. Let me tell you a staggering statistic. Almost 27% of Kentucky children have two or more adverse childhood events. 27%, which is almost 6% higher than the nation's population as a whole. What that should mean to you and what it means to me is that our children, Kentucky children, are starting their lives at a disadvantage compared to their peers in other states. Our kids, my kids, your kids, your grandkids, are going to be less productive, they're going to have less well-paying jobs, they're going to be less healthy, and they're going to not live as long as their peers in other states. That is unacceptable, folks, and it's directly related to our substance abuse disorder problem that we all believe we're addressing and we're turning the tide on, but we have to continue to focus on our children. If not, we will continue to see this issue progress into the future. We will continue to see poverty. We will continue to see uh, generational substance abuse disorder. So I hope if you hear anything I've said today is that we must embrace our children. And I'll talk a little bit about how to do that later. It's not as complicated as, as some people may think. I'm going to briefly um, overview some of the state efforts. Um, as you know, our, our uh, Governor Bevin and, and our legislatures gave almost $30 million for uh, combating substance abuse disorder in Kentucky. Uh, you're going to have Van and uh, Dr. Branzo speak about those issues later, but I, I can assure you that you're going to see the availability of treatment, both uh, if you have substance abuse disorder, the ability for you to seek treatment or for you to refer a friend or family member to treatment, it's going to be available and easier to obtain than it has ever been in the past. But what we're really focused on, and I love this, and this is all Dr. Alan Brenzel who, who, who has put this forward, 
is our recovery support efforts. Because what we, we know now, and what I think most people in this room know, is that after you get through treatment, the real battle starts. And so we have to embrace those folks who are really fighting uh, to remain clean from substances and reintegrate into our society, get back into the workforce, and become a pr productive member. Now, to the issue I was supposed to talk about, and I'm going to go over fairly quickly, is the role of public health. You've heard a lot about this already today, but I like to, at least for the medical students in the room, let me analogize what public health is compared to traditional medicine. And the best analogy, when I went to Harvard School of Public Health, the, the first thing they, they showed us, on, even on orientation, was a video. And this video showed three women on the shore of a river, and a baby comes floating down that river. They run in the river, and they save the baby, and they're patting themselves on the back, back on the shore but all of a sudden three more babies come down that river and they run in and they save those three babies and again they're patting themselves on the back they, they're, and they're out on the shore and then ten babies come and this time they don't save them all, two or three make it past them and they go back out on the shore and they're thinking what, what in the world is happening, why are we seeing these babies in the river and then all of a sudden a hundred come and a thousand and they're saving as many as they can, it's like us and out in our communities practicing medicine. We're treating as much diabetes as we can. It's like substance abuse disorder. We're treating as many people as we can. Finally, one of the women get out and begin to walk up the, up the uh, uh, upstream and the, her friends say, what are you doing? We gotta save these babies. And she, and she says, I'm going to find out why these babies are ending up in the river and I'm gonna to try to stop it there. That's what public health is. We're focused primarily on prevention and getting at the root causes of disease. With that being said, getting at the root cause of substance abuse is incredibly difficult because as it's been said many and many times over, really substance abuse disorder is an epidemic of epidemics. Now I'm not going to quabble uh, about some of the arguments about what caused substance abuse disorder. Some people would say it was physicians over prescribing. I sure think me and my peers have a lot of blame and we have to do a better job and I think we are starting to see that. Some people would argue it's due to the availability of illicit drugs. Perhaps that's true. I think all of it contributes. But in truth, each of us, me, you, uh, and all the people addicted to substance, we're all looking for a high. Everyone is looking for a high in their life. Some of us find it through, uh, through our jobs. Some of us find it through mountain climbing, rock climbing. But for some reason, a certain segment of our population turns to substances. And we have to ask ourselves, why is that? I assume that most people in this room have read the book Dreamland. If you have not, go get it after this and read it. Um, but the core message I took away from that book is that when, when you see substance abuse disorder uh, rising in a population, it's really due to societal despair. It's due to people turning away from community, turning inward, and not getting that high on one another like we normally would. So that, that becomes an issue that we continue to have to address. We have to focus on our communities. And I'm gonna tell you why I think that's important in a bit. One of the core public health functions for substance abuse disorder is quite clearly data and analytics. In public health, we love data and we love analyzing that data and we'll turn it over in as many possible ways as you could, as you could imagine and we look at it from every angle. Our federal funding, our federal funding uh, which is going through the Centers for Disease Control and you saw Dr. R uh, Robert Redfield earlier, is quite clearly linked to um, making data for substance abuse more available and more comprehensive, but most importantly, linking that data across various streams so that we're getting a comprehensive picture of what is happening with substance abuse disorder at any given time in our state. And so what I expect you're gonna see is in partnership with the Kentucky Engine Preventory Center, who is a bona fide agent of your Department of Public Health, we're gonna see linkage of EMS data, uh, with death certificate data, with police data hopefully in the future, so that we're getting a more comprehensive picture of what is going on. The most important thing we do in public health for substance abuse disorder and our, our most prevalent role is prevention. And the, there's a couple different forms of prevention, but one of the major aspects is preventing the infectious complications of substance abuse disorder, especially infectious complications of intraven uh, intravenous drug use. Those complications include things like HIV, hepatitis C, hepatitis A, and, and some other infections. As you know, our state is currently in a hepatitis A outbreak. Our most common risk factor for the spread of hepatitis A in this outbreak is drug abuse. We have over 2,000 cases, folks, and it's directly related to our drug abuse problem. We have one of the uh, highest rates of acute and chronic hepatitis C in the country. It, again, is directly related to our substance abuse problem. It's an issue we have to address. I'm quite convinced that we have not even diagnosed uh, most of the cases of hepatitis C in this state. It's a silent epidemic, and we have to continue to fight to get ahead of that. 
there's been a few things that's kept me awake at night in this role as commissioner. And one of those is HIV. This time last year, for the first time in the history of this state, the transmission of HIV in a community was intravenous drug use. In the entire history of our state, the most common risk factor for those getting new HIV was something other than intravenous drug abuse. Given what happened in Austin, Indiana, just a few years ago, that should scare each and every one of you and should make you realize how important it is we address uh, intravenous drug abuse. Now, there's some opportunities to do that. Um, many of our communities have syringe exchange programs. We have the th right now the third most in the country. I understand there's some hesitations for syringe exchange programs, and that's fine. What I've said from the beginning is I don't expect every community to adopt a syringe exchange, but I do expect every community to have that conversation because it would be disingenuous not to at least have the conversation. It may not be right for your community. But what we cannot forget is that harm reduction is the big umbrella term. And we all have to engage in harm reduction, which means testing for and treating these infectious complications. And if you choose to adopt a syringe exchange, which I see as a, a component of harm reduction, that's fine. Uh, but we really all have to engage in harm reduction. And I think in the next few months, we're going to be announcing a, an effort to expand our funding on harm reduction in the state and hopefully blanket the state in, in greater harm reduction efforts. The other issue that Dr. Uh, Repfeld um, addressed in terms of prevention is preventing deaths. Narcan or naloxone, and hopefully many of you will get to, to visit the trailer outside later, but each of you can save a life with, with Narcan. And so we've adopted the Surgeon General's approach uh, in understanding that if, we, if, if you are in a position that you may encounter someone who is, uh, uses substances, which is everybody in this room, because we all live in communities where people are addicted to substances, you should carry naloxone on you and be prepared to use it. It's easy as using Flonase, folks, and you can save a life with it. My position is that every life is worth saving. I don't care how many times we have to resuscitate someone with naloxone, one, two, three, five, eight times, because I met so many folks who says, I've been resuscitated with naloxone and it took five times, but I'm now clean, I now have a job, I'm now raising my kids. And when you look those people in the eye, you realize that they're human beings, that their life is worth saving. And frankly, as a society, we can't afford to lose these people because we need them contributing to our workforce as a whole. So I'm gonna start concluding. Let me, by, and starting to conclude, let me say this is a big issue. Um, and like I said, it invades many aspects of, of our lives, our economy, our society. But don't be intimidated by its size into inaction. There's that tendency. I earnestly believe small and community efforts are the, are the approach that will get us over the, over, the, uh, over the hump, will truly turn the tide. And let me tell you a personal story about what someone did for me that changed my life when I was growing up in a home with addicted parents. There was a family who, who obviously never mentioned it, but obviously saw what was going on in their lives. And once every few weeks, they would invite me over for dinner. And I would get to sit down at a table and have dinner with a functioning family and have a conversation. Being able to see that really made a difference in my life. You see, it didn't take a lot of money. It didn't take a big state effort or a big federal effort. It didn't even take something as large as SOAR. It just took a family in our community to take an interest. Each of you can go back home and invite a child over for dinner once every few weeks. It's not that hard. So what I would say to you is do what you can, use what you have, and start right where you are. Start in your community, start small. Participate in an after school activity or whatever it is that you can do to engage these children because I honestly believe, as I mentioned when I talked about adverse childhood events, uh, starting with our children, it has to be our priority if we're gonna end the substance abuse crisis in our state. Most importantly, remember, remember that we are in this together. I've been affected by substance abuse disorder. Uh, Representative Atkins mentioned that he had been. I'm sure each of you have been. So we're in this together. We have to overcome that stigma. We have to share our stories and unite around our efforts. And lastly, and many of you have heard me use this quote if you've heard me speak before, but I, I absolutely love it. It comes from our third U.S. president and author of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson. But he says, if you want something that you never had before, you have to be willing to do something you have never done before. It sim that sounds pretty simple, but in practice, oftentimes we tend to do the same things we've done before over and over again. Well, let, me, let me tell you again. If we want to end substance abuse disorder, we want a 
happy and prosperous Eastern Kentucky. We want jobs to be flowing. We want our kids to have the best education. We have to be willing to do things we haven't done before. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you today. You've got a great, uh, great group of speakers. I'm personally excited to hear Senator McConnell later today. Let me say, we are united in this effort. I'm ready to, to continue fighting for Eastern Kentucky. I love being back home with you guys. Again, thank you for what you're doing. Together, let's turn the tide.